sorry, just, just testing it really. Um, we're going to make a start now. So just to say um, a, a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for coming to our 10th Hidden History event. My name is Farzana Qureshi. Uh, and I, along with two of my colleagues that are here, Ludi and Amma, um, who are se seated here as well, they're part of the Hidden Histories team. My other colleague isn't here, but we run these uh, uh, events uh, to, it's, I suppose our aim is to decolonize knowledge production, uh, to reveal those sort of stories that you don't see in the mainstream media. And it's uh, really representing Asian, African and Caribbean um, narratives. Um, so today we are very happy to, oh, okay, yes, I've been told to use this one, which makes more sense. Um, today we have, we're very excited to have Saz Agarwal with us, who is going to be telling us more about the uh, Sindh, Sindhi narrative. Um, and I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping. This is a hybrid event, so we have got people uh, logged in on Zoom. Um, we're going to start with, uh, I'll, obviously I'll, I will hand over to the chair, and then Sars is going to present. Then after that, um, we will, you're having a conversation, and then after that we will open the floor to uh, questions. And also anyone uh, at home, please put your questions in the chat. So we will be um, making sure that the, all the questions get answered. And also please, if you have stories to share, uh, we are very keen to hear uh, your narrative as well. So please use this forum as a, as a chance to share your stories with us. So I'm going to now hand over to Navtej Burawal, who will be chairing the event, and Saz. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Farzana. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's so wonderful to see so many people who clearly, I can see, feel the kind of energy, interest, and passion here today um, to come for, for this event. Um, of course, I want to now welcome Saz um, to SOAS, um, and also just to congratulate you on the beautiful book, which you can see on the side of this copy here as well. Um, it's an honor to have Saz here today to present this work and to introduce us to the idea and the inspiration behind um, the writing and the creation of, of the book. Um, Saz is based in Pune and has, has published a number of books and actually has, is a mathematician by training um, and has jumped over to the art side, um, luckily for, for the world, I guess, to be able to, to see. <laughs> of course, you can do a lot of very useful things in the world of mathematics as well, but to use the kind of creativity around storytelling um, and the production of books that are out there in the public um, uh, sphere um, is a really impactful uh, way to contribute to the ideas here. Uh, Saz's earlier work, one of which is the Stories of a Vanished Homeland, which was published in 2012, um, and also then reprinted in 2013 with Oxford University Press, I believe was also presented at the Karachi Literature Fest as well. Um, um, kind of is the precursor in many ways, I suppose, to this book, uh, which has also been published by Black and White Fountain, which is Saz's own uh, publishing house. So in many ways, I think he'll tell us the story around the, the production of this book. Um, SOAS is a place really where we like to say that we're not only just doing the kind of decolonization work that's happening, of course, through our co colleagues in the library doing this Im important work through this series, um, but also just thinking across the borders in the region, which is also an act of decolonization. <coughs> I just came back from Karachi, uh, Pakistan, and I constantly am going, like to go back and forth across the India-Pakistan border, which is not an easy one to cross, whether we try and do it conceptually or physically, to cross the physical borders, but to be able to, even to think across the border and to make those connections is some, something that we really pride ourselves on here at SOAS, especially in terms of the region of South Asia. My own work, I'm involved in a project called Border Crossings. I don't know if anyone had heard about it, but we had um, the virtual reality, which Farzana was involved in here with Project Dastan last year. Um, we still are actually gonna be doing a couple of one-offs as well, which is using virtual reality technology as a way of crossing the border and thinking intergenerationally and also thinking through time travel really around the elders' experiences and how we can think about building a more progressive future, which um, allows us to think through ideas around empathy, connecting through these stories as well. 
Um, so that's enough about me. I'm a professor here in the Department of Development Studies. I was formerly the deputy director of the South Asia Institute, um, and I, my own work crosses the India-Pakistan border on a, on a regular basis. So it's a real honor for me to be able to be part of this um, here today. So what I'd like to do now is to invite Saz to present um, about the book and to tell basically the story around it. There's multiple stories around the creation of the book. Um, and the format is that she'll be speaking anywhere between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll then have a bit of a conversation and we'll open the floor to any questions um, that you may have or any stories that you may wish to share. So. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Farzana. Thank you, Navtej. Uh, it's such a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, for all, thank you all of you for coming here to listen. I hope you'll enjoy the stories that I'm going to tell you today. Uh, it is going to be based around this book, but I think uh, um, you know I'll take you into I'll take you through the journey that I have been. Um, so we'll start. Is this So um, I'm just going to give you a quick summary of what I'll be speaking about. Uh, so these are what today's talk is going to be about. Uh, when I say that Sindhis didn't speak, I'm also... S is that any better? Just closer to the mic might be what I need to do. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about partition, we never hear. I read you. <laughs> we never talk about Sindh. It's usually the Punjab story. That's what's in the mainstream. And it's really surprising to me, even 75 years later, there was uh, this big article in the New York Times in December last year about the when uh, in terms of the Indian partition, who owns the narrative. And it was an excellent piece of writing. It was really good. It talked about the literature around partition. The word Sindh was not mentioned even once. Again, just a few weeks later, there was a seminar at SOAS about partition. And I stayed up late to, um, to um, you know, attend it. No Sindh, nothing about Sindh. And I find that really odd because Sindh was not partitioned, that's for sure. But it there was such a huge story, and I'm going to try and share a little bit of that with you today. Um, even the Sindhis didn't speak, and that might be part of it, because if the Sindhis had been talking about their story, that might have helped to bring it into the mainstream. But they, you know, I think uh, at least people were just busy adapting to the changes, getting along with the, getting on with their lives, and uh, you know, nothing was recorded, very, very little. I'll tell you what got me interested, and some of the things that I learned, this is going to be the bulk of what I'll be speaking about, which I find very exciting, very interesting, rather. And uh, along the way, I'll tell you about the things that I've done to try and spread the story. And this is what actually got me interested. This is me and my mom, and this was in January 2011. And um, this, the picture was taken in 2011. I think we started on this project a few months after this. Basically, I'm a writer, and I, over the years, I've specialized in working with people uh, to help them write their memoirs. And at some point, I said to my mom, tell me what it was like in Sindh, because none of us know. And what happened, my mother was 13 years old when partition took place. None of us had ever been the least bit interested. And none of them had ever said anything. It didn't seem like you know, something that we wanted to know. It didn't seem like anything that they wanted to speak about. 
And um, she said yes, and she was actually very sporting. She would come and sit in front of me, and I would interview her. And we did that, and on the second day, or maybe the third day, I realized that this is a huge story, and it's never been done, so I'd better do it. And um, what really astonished, it, astonished me was that she retained so much. She had, she was telling me things that happened 65 years ago that she had not spoken about for 65 years, and yet the images were so clear in her mind. And um, I had actually planned to do something for the family, which would have just been you know, her story. We'd have got some photos from her cousins because she didn't have any. Uh, Subhash probably had some. Uh, that's my mom's cousin. And um, I, I then knew that that wasn't enough. So I interviewed a lot of people. I had help from a very kind person who gave me lots of books to read. And that helped me to put this um, together. And um, why I chose the date, I have to tell you this. I chose to do it, uh, to put this book out on the 14th of November because she remembered the date on which her ship arrived in Bombay. So she told me about how they had, why they had to leave, how they left, what the ship journey was like. They traveled, they lived in Hyderabad. So they traveled from Hyderabad to, uh, to Karachi uh, by road. And it was, of course, a very stressful journey because they didn't know what was going to happen to them on the road, and they didn't know what was going to happen to them after that. They'd given away most of their things. They'd packed a little, a few things, and they were traveling by ship. They got onto the ship, and there was a bit of culture shock there because the food was different from what they were used to. And it was two nights on the boat. And then they saw, the next morning, they saw that they could see Bombay. But, she said, we were not allowed to dock. They, we, didn't, uh, we didn't get permission to dock. So it was scary because they didn't know what was going to happen next. They didn't know whether they were going to be sent back, which would have been really or horrible. They'd just left everything. They'd, you know, they, they'd left, they'd packed, they, they would, they would, they'd left. Or were they going to, even worse, were they going to be sent somewhere else, which, uh, you know, where they wouldn't know anyone, some strange place. Two nights they were on the ship. And then she says to me, we arrived in Bombay, and it was the 14th of November. And that really was so, I found it really moving. I felt, uh, I honestly felt really guilty that none of us had ever bothered to ask anything before because it was such a big thing that had happened to them. We never respected the kind of uh, you know, losses they'd made and just took it all for granted. Uh, so this book happened, and... Um, uh, I was really very lucky because Oxford University Press in Pakistan published the book. They uh, bought the rights from me for Pakistan. And being a university press, that's how it got into the university libraries, you know, because as uh, Farzana, to, uh, sorry, Navtej told you when we started, I, I did the book myself. I actually uh, didn't have the time. I wanted it out on the 14th of November. I could do things like, I registered an imprint, I got ISBN numbers from the government, I learned how to use InDesign so that I could make my own pages, and I got the book, I mean, my daughter designed the book, and she did a really good job. She's not a professional designer, but she has some talent, and I always say that people took the book seriously because it has such a fab cover. Uh, Oxford University Press cha did change just one word. The, the book was completely intact. They took out one chapter, which was uh, the story of somebody who left Sindh in the 1970s, a Hindu family who left Sindh in the 1970s, and they actually migrated to my city, which is Pune. But they didn't change a single word of what I'd written, which gave me some validation for, for the work I'd done. But they changed a word in the title. And they said, we can't call it a vanished homeland because the Sindhis of Sindh will not like that. They, they will tell us that uh, your land <laughs> Our land has not vanished. We are here. So that also told me a little about how the Sindhis of Sindh felt, which I really did not know till then. I had no idea. That was my first uh, the inkling that I had, that there is something going on, not just with the Hindu Sindhis, but also the Sindhis, the majority community who Sindh belonged to. Uh, 
after that, it was amazing because I started getting stories and people started sharing with me their stories, their photos. And you can see if you look at them, you know, the way people dressed, it makes you think, it tells you about, uh, a, you know, a, a different era, I, uh, the different kind of headgears and, uh, you know, the embroidered caps and what they're wearing around their necks and here this and then you know apart from the clothes which are kind of different to what um i was just telling uh Nathij about somebody a writer in hong kong who's writing about she's trying she's doing a cindy story for children and she asked me at some point was did cindy women wear salwar kameez and i said no they had a, something a bit different she said but you know online it says that Cindy's wore salwar kameez. So then I just thought I need to get out some more, you know, better quality information out there. Because if this isn't a salwar kameez, they wore sutan cholo and uh, uh, a scarf, uh, which is called rawo. And apart from that also, a little bit of the furniture and, you know, the kind of architecture. This is uh, my mom's cousin Laji at a refugee camp, a Mulund camp. And, you know, so many lovely stories, people sitting on the khatta and doing crochet, this young woman doing crochet. So that was a big thing, of course. And this is Nehru visiting the Sakhar Baraj. Um, that's, this book is, this uh, image is actually in the book. This was given to me by um, Nalini Advani, who is in the center. She was um, probably 19 years old, and she was... Uh, in this camp, the Mulund camp again, and they started a school there. And she in Hyderabad, she had done extremely well. She'd finished her school leaving exams and she wanted to study. She, ha she wanted to study at the National College in Hyderabad. And she told me, you know, I wanted to study and study as much as anyone could study. But of course, because partition took place, she couldn't. Now, she, was, she volunteered as a teacher at the school. And it's an amazing story because the school came out of the refugee camp. And of course, Nalini, she told us how the, in, in, for the first month, the children sat on the floor and the teachers, you know, taught them that way. And then um, at the end of the month, they collected fees from the students. And in the third month, they could buy furniture. And then they got recognized by the government. And then there were other educationists from Sindh who, were, who had also lost their home, who joined and who um, taught. And then she herself, um, studied education. She eventually retired as a school teacher, a school principal in Delhi. And the, the Jahin school, which started that way now, has 8,000 students or maybe more. When I last checked, it was 8,000, probably more by now. So here, this is, uh, okay, uh, let me just play this little clip from an interview that uh, I did. Brothers, and they were staying directly opposite and I still remember this, though I paid no attention to it. I remember Manju, a younger man, telling me once, we are going to get that house of yours. So eventually a time came when they knew they had to leave. And uh, I, of course, had these other things happening along the way. More books happened. This one I, I, I will tell you about a little later. Uh, because... Last year in uh, February, I decided that I've put together a lot of stuff uh, and I decided I want to do something for the new generation and make it as concise as possible, put in all the stories, put in a, a range of representative stories, but make it simple and pass on the messages that I want to pass on. So that's why I did this book. And one of the things that happened is that I had a difficult time finding a map. One of the people I interviewed, Tulsi Moinani, who uh, I'll tell you more about him later, he told me he was actually born in Indonesia, where his father was a businessman. But then the family moved back to live in Hyderabad, and he was one year old when partition took place when partition took place. And he told me that, you know, nobody told us what partition was. No, our parents didn't tell us. You know, we went through the whole thing, but we had no idea. So when you do this book, explain what partition was. So for that, I needed, it wasn't going to be just the stories. It had to be an actual 
few lines of explanation about what partition was, and it was, it, it was not easy. But I thought we need a map, and it was so interesting that I couldn't find a map that did justice to it. it you know, the thing is that the border kept changing. I think, as we know, the actual border was only announced after independence took place, and that time before people knew where the border was was crazy because they did not know. You know, you're celebrating independence, but you don't know which country you live in. And uh, another thing that a lot of uh, people I found, a lot of people aren't really aware of, that it wasn't all British India. There was this huge, um, you know, there were so many princely states, 565 states which were autonomous. Anyway, this, uh, this is the map we chose, which seemed the less controversial. The border kept changing. That's another thing I realized. The border kept changing till today. You know, we don't really have a border that is recognized by everybody. But I picked this because it, didn't, it had the least uh, questions to it. And um, I think we need to move back. Should I just use this? So uh, then I knew I had to start with this, which is the story uh, I was, again, I was told by, um, first by my mom and then by a number of people, which is that in Sindh, you could fly a kite any day you wanted because it hardly ever rained in Sindh. And the thing to remember is that people often think of Sindh as this inhospitable place, a desert with, you know, difficult language, difficult living conditions. But for children who lost their home, it was the place that you could go out and fly your kites. And, you know, that tells you a little bit about what it means to lose your home. And then we came, of course, to the point of departure. Uh, this is quite a common um, experience. Many of the people I've um, interviewed, they remembered what happened as they were leaving. Many of them remember the name of the ship they traveled on. And of course, there were so many who traveled by train. And we've seen the pictures, but of course, pictures don't always tell you the story. I was lucky to interview people who gave me an insight into how things were actually happened. This uh, young boy with the pen in his hand is my friend Rashna's father, Rusi Damanya. And I interviewed him when he was in his mid-80s. And he was in a boarding school uh, near Nasik. And four boys from the school who had very good handwriting were picked to go and live in the Asali camp. And there, their job was to write down the names of the refugees coming in. And Rusi remembered his time there, so much clarity. He talked about the uh, trains coming in filled with people sitting on the tops and they were all wearing white. I didn't actually understand why they were all wearing white. And later I realized it's because that white is unbleached cloth, which, which is you know uh, easiest to procure. So a lot of people wore that. And he told us that he was, they were taught a few sentences of Sindhi, Tunjanalo Chai, Tunja Pijanalo Chai, what's your name, your father's name. So they had to write down, you know, they were documenting the people who were coming in. So, you know, that gives you a picture of what it was like that uh, children were recording the entry of people. And he also told me about how horrible the food was and, you know, the conditions in the camp were really terrible. But he also told me that they were given an Alsatian dog to God knows why. <laughs> you know, you just think of the, the, the way camps were set up and what it meant to be in a camp, and dogs were a part of that. Then I had this uh, Nari Shahani who also told me his family story. Nari was a child. He gave me these photos, and uh, this, this is the illustration that the book has. Uh, which is derived from these two. And this is in a place in Bombay, the biggest camp, uh, the biggest refugee camp in India, which is a Kalyan camp. Uh, and the place was later named Ulhas Nagar, which means the city of joy. Now for Nari, it was a happy time. He didn't, I mean, he was living with his family. He was a child. He was very happy. His 
Uh, he was living in a joint family with his parents and his siblings. And across the road were his uh, mother's parents. So, you know, for him, it was a joy. It actually was Ulhas Nagar. Then I had this other story from this lady who you can see at the window. And her name is Sushila Rao. And she, her husband was a camp commandant. And she, when I interviewed her, she would have been in her late 80s or maybe early 90s. And she also remembered it in great detail. Now, she's not a Sindhi. Uh, and uh, she, her husband was a camp commandant. So, she, you know, she was living in a camp, but completely separate from the, their lives were separate. They led a normal middle class life. She had a, a, a baby. You know, she was newly married. Then, you know, so then the baby was born. And uh, you can see, you can read the story in the book. But what she told me is that w if I ever woke up, in the early hours, I would look out of the window and I would see them walking to the railway station. And she described to me what she saw them. You know, you can see in the picture, of course, uh, what she told me, the point she was trying to make is they were so hard working. They didn't want to live in the camp. They wanted to get out of the camp as soon as they could. So they were selling, they were walk going to uh, work in Bombay or they were selling things from door to door. And then you can see young people going to college. I'll tell you about the picture. I'm, I've been showing you the picture, so I want to tell you a little bit about it. I said, I said, did say that I got the idea for the book in February, and I was actually uh, in a vipassana course when and that's a ten-day retreat, a silence retreat, and uh, it's a time when you're supposed to be meditating, and of course you uh, you know spend your time thinking about various things, and I got this fabulous idea, so it was quite distracting. But when I came out, I immediately looked for somebody. I asked someone I know, can you do these kind of illustrations? And she said, no. So I, I, anyway, I found somebody. And I was so lucky because he, was this, he did this amazing job. All I wanted was, and that's not asking for much, all I wanted was that the uh, illustrations should be historically authentic and that people should be recognizable. So whether it's Nehru or Gandhi, or whether it's somebody's grandfather, whoever, if anyone knew that person, they should recognize. And he did it. And you can see here the, from the clothes people are wearing, we did a lot of work to make sure we didn't make any mistake on the footwear and on the packaging of the goods and the containers and stuff. And he was really, and um, this uh, picture, you can see the Kalyan Station, it's actually, uh, we've, I found a reference for him, which is a picture of Kalyan Station. And uh, on the internet, it said 1945. But I don't think it was 1945, which tells you that you can't really trust the internet. Because if you look at it, it says, it says Kalyan in three languages, and one of those languages is Sindhi. And it's impossible. I, I mean, it may, be, it may not be impossible, but unlikely that there was a Sindhi sign on that railway station before it became a Sindhi settlement. Uh, and I showed you this before, but since I was telling you about the illustrations, I thought I'd just mention this one. Uh, the story next to this is just a few lines. It doesn't really tell you about the picture. Now, the picture is actually Hyderabad in the 1940s, and we made a lot of effort to include all the architectural flourishes that you could see in uh, Hyderabad at that time. And Hyderabad was actually did have a lot of very fancy buildings because there was money coming into Hyderabad, which I'm going to tell you about a little later, how that happened. Um, there, Hyderabad had something called a mang, which you can see on the roots, which was a wind catcher, which is quite unusual. You see it in some Arab countries, but there were a lot of them in Hyderabad. And you even, um, can you see the pointer on this, uh, pointing at the car? So that's an actual car which belonged to somebody called Bhai Pratap. And uh, you know this was his home, Maitri Bhavan. So there's a lot of actual Hyderabad in here. Bhai Pratap is very much there in the book. Uh, the other thing that happened is when we actually had proof copies of the book out when somebody was looking at this picture and said, oh, this looks like a Rajasthani fort. And I was like, oh my god, what a big blooper. And we went back and looked at the uh, fort of Hyderabad, the Pakko Kilo. And we fixed that. So this is actually the Pakko Kilo. I have people here from Hyderabad, so I hope you'll agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, OK, so I told you about the camps. But of course, there were so many people who just landed up you know, in some place they'd never been to before. 
And this story was told to me by somebody who I was working with to help him write his memoirs. And he, he had nothing to do with Sindh, but because he knew I'm interested in Sindhi stories, he told me about the time when he was a student at Bits Pilani, which is an engineering college in uh, Rajasthan. Uh, I think he was probably in the first or second year of the Bits Pilani. And he went home to Agra, where his parents lived for the holidays. And the city was filled with refugees. And his father was a social worker. That was very much part of his memoir. So, you know, I'd been listening to him telling me about his father's life and uh, the kind of things that he'd done. They lived, they lived in a village in Uttar Pradesh. And after he uh, retired, after independence, they settled in Agra. Now, people, the refugees were coming in by train. Agra's not a port, but as, as you know, uh, so uh, refugees were coming by train and by surface. And there were camps, but this family, he, uh, uh, Mr. Dubey's father, met them at the railway station and he brought them to his home. So there was this man and his mother and his wife and two children and a baby. And so he brought them home and they had nothing. They had carried stuff with them when they left, but they'd lost everything on the way. So they came to, you know, Mr. Dubey gave them, uh, you know, their veranda and said, you be comfortable here. They had a bath. And after the bath, they had to wear the same clothes again because, you know, they washed the clothes and wore them again because they didn't have anything else to wear. And in the morning, uh, this man went to the wholesale market. Now you can see, like, he's quite, you know, a uh, well-off person. Uh, but he went to, he, he, he may have had some kind of retail store in, um, in Sindh, in Hyderabad, or wherever he came from. But he went to the wholesale market and he bought a huge sack of grain and he carried it to the retail section and he sat on the pavement. And this is actually an Agra pavement, which is from uh, an illustration that used as a reference. So he sat in the retail section and people were, who came to buy obviously bought from him because he was selling at a lower rate. So he sold everything in the sack. And then he sold the sack as well. And that's a metaphor again for the way Sindhis dealt with partition. They sold everything and then they sold the sack. And uh, what he told me is that on the third day, we didn't have to feed them anymore. And within a few years, they had their own factory making shoes. So I showed you some of the other books that I did. Uh, yeah, so this was one particular community of Sindh. And this I did during the lockdown. Uh, it's a collection of essays. It, I didn't write it myself. I put out word to people I knew who were interested in the subject. And some of them are senior academics. Some of them uh, were business people, artists, a photographer. Various people actually got 59 contributions, and I wrote one as well. So there's 60 essays, fabulous essays in this book, which talk about the Sindhi identity. Uh, now, one of the things which I will tell you a little bit about later is that many of them spoke about the prejudice that Sindhis face. And that's, uh, that's something which a lot of Sindhis you know, I told you about the man sitting on the pavement selling things at a price lower than um, what you can buy in the shops. So obviously, people selling in the shops felt they were being cheated in a way. Uh, they didn't like it. So we don't know where the roots of the prejudice are, but it could be from there. Then I also found when I started writing, in fact, from the earliest, like right after my first book, I started getting messages from people. Uh, uh, you know, people would send me emails. And from it was very exciting for me because I was getting messages from all around the world. I got a message from someone in Santiago, Chile. I got a message from Trinidad. Then, you know, people in... Uh, Indonesia, people in the Philippines, I didn't understand it at first. I just thought that, yeah, Sindhis, you know, after partition, they went to all these places. But because I was meeting people and talking to them, because I'd started traveling to document the diaspora, uh, I had the opportunity to do this. I was really lucky. And I also had the opportunity to meet other people in the field so I could hear, you know, listen to them, read their books, and get their insights. 
And that's when I realized that there is a global diaspora and it's not something that started after partition. It was something that started way before. And there is, this is a map which was uh, made by Professor Claude Markowitz, who is a French historian and researcher. And he documented two trade networks coming out of Sindh. And um, uh, these are the places that there were Sindhi businesses way before, a hundred years before, it started a hundred years before, nearly a hundred years before independence. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, I'll tell you quickly how this happened. It was when uh, the British conquered Sindh. And the British came into Sindh in 1843. And I'm sorry, most of you here are British, so I'm not actually talking about you, you know that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so they came in and um, in gross violation of the treaties they'd made with the princes of Sindh. It was a terrible thing they did. So it was not that easy for the traders because A, they'd lost their biggest customers. The Mirs and you know all the rulers were uh, deposed and sent away to exile in Calcutta or wherever. They, they were horrible. They separated them from their children and they, they, were, they, you know, they didn't kill them, but they did terrible things to them. So for the traders, they'd lost their best customers and there was this new company in, would, would, they'd come in with their own products, their own suppliers, and they even introduced the company Rupee. And you know, so those who were trading in, who were you know, uh, lending money for a living, it was a difficult time. But they realized that the British love Cindy handicrafts and Cindy, Cindy handicrafts are really something special. So they started hawking them from door to door. And uh, you know they'd go in with a pile of things, and they'd say, uh, the Mame Saab would say, "Oh, is that Sindh work?" And then the guy says, "Huh, yes, madam, Sindh work." So that they became called Sindh workies. And very soon they would see them, you know, pushing off on their steamer trunks with big, big bags full of Sindh work. So they started, a uh, bunch, bunch of young boys did this. Did this. They got on board and uh, they got off at, I don't know where, Eden, Cairo, Gibraltar, whatever. And they were selling. They started selling. They started doing well. And once you start selling, you have those skills of knowing how to sell. You don't have to stick to synth work. You can sell anything. Then, they, then you set up a shop and then you have a shop and then you call your brother or your neighbor's son or whoever and then you establish a presence and then more and more of those annoying competitors come from Hyderabad, so then you have to move on to the next uh, port. And uh, soon enough, this is what happens, you're all over the world. So um, this is where we were. And I'm gonna tell you the story that I picked for this book, which is about Muli. And there are many reasons because Muli's story is, um, first of all, you had this phenomenon where you had the men, many of the men were going away on Sindh work. And the boys, they would leave when they were 16 years old and then they'd go and live in these far off countries with a different language and a different climate and they would be living there for two or three years at a time. And their families would be without them. Many of them, they'd go, as I said, they'd go at the age of 16. After the first uh, Musafri, they'd come back home and the family would have arranged a good match for them. So they would get married and then they'd go again and then three years later they'd come back. It was very, I mean, they were, that's where the money was coming in from. I told you this, right? They were building mansions. They, they had, I mean, some of them even had flush toilets, which was really a big deal. And all kinds of fancy furniture and things like that, which you can see part of here. And it, they weren't, obviously, everybody wasn't rich. It was the, you know, they had the capitalists and they had their workers. So to, for the workers, it was a difficult life because they lived in the in a room above the shop and they had to do their own housework and they had to, they didn't see their families for years at a time. Sometimes the bosses didn't pay them, you know, because they actually, the arrangement was that they would give the money to their families. So here's Muli, who's sitting in the center. She is, uh, I think, 16 years or 17 years old at the time, and her parents are on either side of her. And her father was actually working. He was not, uh, it's a big thing in among the Sindhi business community, uh, whether you have uh, your own business or you, ha or you are uh, 
uh, working for someone else because I know I know that because when I say oh so your father was working in Durban and, and they'll be like no no my father had his own business in Durban I say that because I work right so I'm saying oh your father and he would say, no my father had a business so anyway Modi's father was working for uh, but he was so well off that he could afford to live like this and um, they've uh, the uh, these people this is Rami who is uh, Muli she's come to see Muli for her uh, for her son, for her stepson, actually. This is the elder boy, uh, Ramchand, and um, this this is their cousin. And they've come uh, to see Muli, where, to see whether she's they like her for, their, for uh, their son. Now, what I was told is, uh, and there was a little bit of debate about this, but when they had, they were so wealthy that when they had a special visitor, as these people are, they would give them a gold guinea in, the, in their drink, which they could keep when they finished drinking what they drinking. And you can actually see uh, the gold guinea, if you look. That's uh, Shubodeep. I, I, sh I, I, didn't, I told you that I found this really amazing artist. I did tell you this, right? I, and his name is Shubodeep Mukherjee. And it was such a pleasure to work with him. He was amazing. I showed you the Hyderabad photo where uh, we found the fort, and he just didn't have any, you know, I mean, I don't like it when people tell me, oh, can you just write, rewrite this bit? He said, okay, fine, I want to get it right, and he just, so anyway, that's Shubo for you. Then uh, what happened to Muli when partition took place? So the men were all away, right? Her, uh, she actually, so actually uh, her, this one, the little one in her, who she's carrying, she's in the center here, he was actually born in uh, Indonesia where, uh, because she went after they got married, she went to Indonesia and they had children. She spent the war, they had the war years in Indonesia, very, very difficult time. And uh, at some point they decided that, you know, she missed home and life was hard. So they decided to come and live in Hyderabad. And um, when partition took place, she was alone. That's her uh, sister on the side with her two children. Luckily, some of her children, you can see her, uh, you know, the daughter and her son, Divak, and her elder daughter, Mohini, they were bigger, so they could help her, but they didn't know where they were going. You know, they were alone, and the, the I, I mean, this is there in the book. You can, you can read about it. It's about how they had to, they were just wandering from one station to the other, and they were talking to other people who were also in the same situation, getting ideas from each other. Eventually, they... Uh, were reunited, you know, her husband sent her money and they eventually, he arranged for them to come back to Indonesia. Now, I found that it was, you know, you have this huge diaspora, they, they had, it was just trade outposts and it, they evolved into communities. Now, when I went, I traveled, uh, you know, in the diaspora to an extent, the thing is that it's so big. I was in Iquique, Chile, with some Sindhis, and they did not know. Satguru is obviously a Sindhi name. I mean, it's a Sindhi warehouse. Nobody knew who it belonged to. So, you know, even in that small community, it's such a huge thing. I did find out eventually, because I put it on, it's there in one of my YouTube videos, and somebody said, Satguru belongs to XXX. So we do know it's not an anonymous person, but at that point I found, it told me how big the, uh, the spread is. Uh, and this is one of the books I published, which again is completely by chance. Um, sorry, can I thought I had my phone here. Can someone tell me? Yeah, I just want to know the time. I just got this little thing. Sorry, this, this, I don't want to go on too long. So uh, this collection of stories somebody sent to me, and he said, will you read my stories? And I was like, hmm. Sindhi businessman has written a book? No, 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 I don't think so. So I just was lying on my, you know, on the side of my table and thinking, oh God, now what's going, what am I going to get sent next? And um, at some point I was presenting a paper at a conference at Jamia Milia and the theme was related to this. So I said, okay, I have to do research. Let me read this book. And I started reading it and I only realized when the doorbell rang and I didn't feel like opening the door, that I was on the fourth story and I was really enjoying it. So I was very impressed and then I uh, connected with Murli and we obviously became good friends because he's such a lovely, amazing person. 
and I got him to write a few more. Uh, and we, I published this book, which is set in the diaspora. So it's all around the world, and it's an amazing book because A, and Murli, as it turns out, he's not just a Sindhi businessman. He grew up in Shillong. He loves to read. He loves to read so much that one day when he was a child, he got locked in the Shillong Public Library. <laughs> You know, the uh, security locked it, and he was like, oops, what do I do now? And he had crawled out, you know, in the morning so that nobody would know. And uh, then he studied English. Of course, he was helping in his father's business. Of course, when he got married, he started a Coca-Cola distributorship. But he kept writing, and he did his PhD in English literature. And he even taught at Thongkar Dev College in Shillong. And he wrote these lovely, lovely stories. So I... Um, and he called it uh, a gift of my travels. Now, I also have a gift of my travels, which is that I saw religion in the diaspora. And it's really quite, um, it's quite interesting because, you know, when you look at partition, you're looking at religion. If you're a certain religion, then you can't stay on this side of the border. But if you look at the Sindhis, you'd Take a closer look. You really don't know what religion you are. They are, and here, this is Punta Arenas, which is uh, in Chile, in the, near the South Pole. And uh, I don't know how clearly you can see it, but there are so many different religions represented here. And this is in Malaga. It's the same. In uh, on the right, you have the Hindu gods, and uh, you also on the left, you have various uh, uh, divine. And here, this is interesting. This is the Church of the Black cross in Panama, and uh, this person, it's a, very, it's a bit of a blurred picture, but he climbed up, uh, uh, you know, he took me to see it as a tourist, but he wanted to pay his respects, so he took off his shoes and climbed up to the altar, which I thought was lovely. You only see people doing that in the subcontinent, taking off shoes. It's not something people do uh, in most countries. I mean, I don't think anyone else in this church took off their shoes, but um, Lakshman Kriplani, he did that. And this is in Sindh, where uh, some people took us to this darga. It's clearly a darga, but is it a darga? Is it a temple? Is it a, um, you know, gurdwara? You can see Guru Nanak is there as well. So it's all this so much of, so many choices, so much flexibility, and you know, more uh, striving towards good thoughts and uh, peace in life and things like that. And apparently, it was like that in Sindh. And this picture. Is, uh, it's a painting by Mengraj Talreja, who was 1924. He lives in Thane. He actually did this in his, uh, when he was in his 80s. He, he was a teacher, an art teacher, but then he has his own body of work. And he's done all kinds of things. And of course, the ones that I love the best are his Sindhi uh, uh, pictures, his paintings. And I didn't know, I wouldn't have guessed. He told me, this is a family celebrating Diwali. Which, you know, if you look at how they are dressed, and you, can't, you can't really see that. And um, yeah, I even today, if you look at this, um, on the left is actually Sewan Sharif, where you have a Hindu uh, in charge of uh, the processions. And on the right is a shrine of a Sufi saint uh, in Ulasnagar. So to an extent, it's still there. But of course, I can't pretend that it's still the same story because as we all know, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on. Let me just quickly show you this. Ganesh actually, of course, was part of the pantheon in Sin, but the procession, um, which you take the idol down to a body of water at the end of 11 days, it was actually done in Karachi, but it was done by the Maharashtrians because it was more of a Maharashtrian festival then. But when the Sindhis uh, left Sin, then they lived in Pune and Bombay, Mumbai, uh, they also started doing it, and I know many, many, many Sindhi families who do it, and they don't just do it in Pune and Mumbai, but they do it in Las Palmas, and they do it, they do it everywhere, you know, all around the world, and you saw it uh, in Kampala as well. 
so quickly about Jhule Lal. Uh, I actually have had people I've interviewed telling me, oh, in Sin there was no Jhule Lal, which is, uh, of course, it's not true. Uh, it's just what they mean is that in, in Sin our family was Nanak Panti. And uh, many of the people, I've, that's unfortunately, that's been my demographic. I haven't obviously covered everything. Because here again, um, Mengraj Talreja is showing us that in Sin Jhule Lal was very much, uh, you know, this is a kind of uh, um, uh, procession that they had. And, you know, I, I love this because you can see, I, I think he might have actually got L.K. Advani in there. Does that look like L.K. Advani by any chance? But yeah, it's, uh, you know, lots of different kinds of people. Again, the headgear and, you know, the kind of, yeah, I mean, you can see so many, like, here, look at him. I mean, you don't think this man with this, uh, with a hat like this is a Hindu, do you? Uh, here, what I wanted to say, this is in the book, it's about how Julelal became an icon of uh, the Sindhis, because after partition, when people were in the camps, um, they were really like distraught. They were, they were so, you know, they were so lost and they were wretched actually and uh, very bitter, very disillusioned. This person in the middle, a, a lot of people, a lot of the better off Sindhis did their best to help them. Now this gentleman who you can see on the stage in the middle on the matka, he is uh, Dr. Ram Panjwani. He was a professor of Sindhi at Jain College. And I've been told that he would travel at his own expense to the camps just to sing and, you know, cheer up people. And I was told by uh, an elderly Cindy that he would always end his performance by singing Jule Jule Lal, Jule Lal. And that's how, you know, that's why we had Jule Lal rising from the river behind them. Uh, Coming back, so yeah, what I wanted, why I'm showing you this again, is this basically just because uh, we have, uh, I, I've told you about this huge, there's a lot of homogeneity, a uh, heterogeneity in this community, a lot of heterogeneity. But when it came to this point of crisis, they behaved like one. And everybody, and not just individuals, but families, the community at large, moved on and didn't look back, settled in a new place, adapted, and began contributing. And I've always felt that this is what nobody really understands and appreciates. For me, this is the biggest part of, and that's why I wanted to write this book, which gave this message. Unfortunately, what happened is that they lost so much. And this is, uh, one of the things they lost, which was their mother tongue, uh, people stopped speaking in Sindhi to their children. When they left Sindh, they stopped speaking in Sindhi. And uh, unfortunately, the state had its role to play in this because in 1950, when the constitution was published, Sindhi was not a national language. So, uh, you know, there was absolutely no point in learning Sindhi or, you know, be sending your children to a Sindhi medium school. Sindhi was still running Sindhi medium schools. The government wasn't supporting it. But that was the writers and the thinkers. And normal people, they just want to get on with their lives, right? So people stopped. Then something else happened. They said, why are we using this script? Our script is Devnagri. So they introduced Sindhi in Devnagri. And, you know, I ask people, how can you say that this script is difficult? In Sindh, children were learning it. But they say, no, no, we can't do it. And they moved to Devnagri. And that meant that there's a wealth of literature in this script. And even those who learn Sindhi in Devnagri, don't, they, they don't have any access to it. People don't know. Now, today, <laughs> there's a lot of efforts being made to revive Sindhi. But uh, yeah, and I, I do believe that it'll come back. It's uh, hopefully. I learned this, which I didn't know. Uh, this is another book I published. And this, the interesting thing here is Shakuntala. She's talking about my Sindh. She'd never been to Sindh. 
hardly ever likely to go to Sindh, but you know the feeling, uh, the nostalgia for places you've never seen. That's something I've seen with many people. And she writes about the Pahakas. Now, Pahakas are there in many languages, but you know, she remembered stuff that was, uh, uh, which she heard when she was a child. And she also taught, told me about the vocabulary where you, just for one thing, which in English you have one word, you have like seven words in Sindhi. Bad luck, nobody knows any of those anymore. Um, he, and here we have uh, Shah Abdul Lati, who you might have heard of. I had not heard of until I started you know, um, talking to my mom. In fact, my mom said, oh, our Shah Jo Rasalo. I don't, I, it didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't feel attracted to it at all. But I did realize now, I do realize now that the kind of influence those thoughts of secularism and of uh, you know, having not being compartmental in your thoughts about how to lead a good life, I think they come from him. And uh, a lot of the vocabulary is what I've heard, what I've learned, that uh, they, it, it does come from uh, Shah Abdul Latif. The other thing, other than the language, is that the history of sins. A lot of history got diluted and it just disappeared. Here, this is something we came across when we visited Hyderabad. It's very, very sweet because it says sacred memory. And there's this list of people who were associated with the Theosophy Hall. They were all thinkers. And nobody remembers them anymore. And here, uh, this is uh, uh, Seth uh, Harchandrai Vishandas. Uh, and this actually I got from Shakuntala, whose book cover I just showed you. Uh, she married into, she married his great-grandson. Or was it his grandson, sorry. Uh, he was a father of the Karachi municipality. And uh, after partition, all the statues were desecrated. So this I saw, saw in Dawn, uh, where it, it, the, the, it, the piece was called The Beheaded Benefactor. And Akhtar Baluch, unfortunately, we lost him. He died a few months ago. But he was somebody who went around Karachi ferreting out stories of its history, which was, was suppressed. Uh, this is Shubo and me, the first time we met. We'd already done quite a bit of work on the book. And he said to me, you know, a book like this, you need to have a center spread. And that really freaked me out because I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But right there I remembered this image, which is again from Shakuntala Bhadwani's book. Uh, it's, in one of, it's in a book about her family called Ratan Jyot. And it, this picture is of Gandhi's 1916 visit to Sindh. So I said, let's take this and let's parody it. Most of the images are very historic. I mean, they are historically authentic. But I said, let's take this. Let's put Gandhi in the middle. And let's have a lot of interesting people all around. And it became this symbol of Gandhi at the center of things and Gandhi himself partitioned and Gandhi on both sides. So that's our center spread. And you can see. Um, you can see a lot of uh, people. Uh, there are a lot of freedom fighters uh, who I, um, you know, of course, L.K. Advani is there. I got this picture from the BJP website. But uh, you can also see, I, I had to obviously put my grandfather in and all his brothers. Uh, this is Bhai Pratap, who you'll learn more about when you uh, read the book. And uh, various people, various interesting people, uh, Anand Mingorani. Uh, let me not tell you about Anand Kingorani because I just started this podcast a few weeks ago and this is today's episode which is about the freedom movement in Sindh which was huge. People don't really know how much Sindhis fought for freedom and how uh, extensive it was across the gender, uh, you know, men, women and children. Uh, Subhash Vijlani was is the guest on this uh, uh, was the guest on this episode, and he talked about his. I hope you're going to listen to it. He'll talk. He talks about his family's contribution, uh, and um, uh, yeah. So I'm going to get, tell you this story before I end, and uh, <laughs> so this actually happened in London. My friend uh, Dr. Gulmetlo, who's here. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. It really means a lot to me that you're here. Mm -hmm. So he and he introduced me to uh, 
Dr. Malkani, Dr. Meer Meer Hassan, Meer Hassan Malkani and his wife Farzana. So they came. He is actually a hair transplant. He has a practice on uh, Harley Street and he's London's foremost hair transplant specialist. So they brought this rug and they told me the history. So uh, his mum was from the village of Malkani in Sindh. And when partition came, his grandfather's best friend was Mulo. And Mulo came to him and said, I'm leaving. And he said, no, no, why are you leaving? And Mulo said, look, everybody's going and I have to go. And the, he wasn't able to convince him. So Mulo left. But before he left, he gave him various things from the house which they couldn't take along. And uh, Mir Hassan told me that uh, there was this fancy tray they had when they had guests in the house. They would tell him, Mulo varo tray khani achu, you know. So they had... Uh, uh, things that they were still using. And they had this rug which had the name Valecha Kodumal woven into it. If you can see, uh, it's right across the middle. And her, his mom gave it to him and he said, now you have to find the owner so that you can tell, you can give them the rug and tell them how much your, fam your grandfather, um, how much your family meant to our family. So we are still looking if any of uh, if you uh, know where Kodumal, Valecha Kodumal is, please get in touch. And that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for being so attentive. Thank you so much, Saz, for just such an illuminating talk and the visually and the stories. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time, but I wanted to just, I have a few of my own questions and I'd like, and I'll be inviting some questions as well from the audience. Um, I, you've spoken a lot about kind of your personal, yeah, thank you, Hassan, and you can join in as well. Thank you. So much of this project is, you know, about about Sindh, about this shared community, which is dispersed and scattered, and yet sort of also exists within Sindh, which is now in Pakistan, but also there's global diasporas. It's quite a complex um, history. Uh, and, you know, we might say even the social tapestry, you've published a book yeah. on tapestry. There's a tapestry there around Sindh. I'm just wondering what you, you know, what does it mean for you in terms of your personal history and also the histories of these people? You know, how do you understand the, the idea of Sindh, even the idea of homeland through this project? I know you've been doing it for, for a long time now, but in, in a nutshell. Yeah, thank you so much for that lovely question. It's very, very complicated, and I don't know where to start. I think I should start by saying that I never really thought of myself as a Sindhi, and... Uh, uh, partly that's because uh, I uh, grew up in, my father was not a Sindhi. Uh, we grew up in a third part of India, which was very remote from Sindh. And then we lived in Bombay, where everybody is just a person. You know, you don't really think about where they are from or anything like that. Uh, and as I said about, as I told you about when uh, um, well, I was telling about tapestry, there's a certain, like, you know, people think about Sindhis as just being very money-minded and, um, you know, they'll try and cheat you and uh, tasteless. And actually, when, you know, there's that public perception. But when I think about my family, when I think about my grandparents, they're just the opposite of that. I mean, exact opposite of that. But somehow, you know, when there's a public perception like that, that just overrides everything. So uh, when uh, I'm to answer your question, it became my project to put out a lot of good quality information, authentic and meaningful, and with a lot of detail about the Sindhis. 
basically to dissipate that um, erroneous notion. Mm. That's what mm -hmm. uh, got, I mean, that's what I do. Mm. You know, so the, I mean, this is kind of hinting to what I was going to ask next, which is, I mean, this moment last year and it's carrying on the kind of commemorations of 75 years of, of the partition. And, and actually Sindh being really missed out from a lot of the discussions and the public narratives and public discourse. But there's that silence. Um, and I just want, actually, I've been following that myself, is thinking, why now? Why now? And, you know, you see very hegemonic forces trying to own the narrative as well. You know, nationalism is huge in South Asia. Religion, religious nationalism is huge, and it actually owns the narrative. I mean, for some of us who were looking, and you could hear it in your talk, you know, Sindh is a region that really does actually represent the antithesis of the kind of religious chauvinism, which says it's for the majority, and therefore it's either, you know, Hindu majoritarianism on the one side, or, you know, Islamicization on the other. And in between, you have regions like Sindh, which are articulating something very different, which is from the bottom up, it's syncretic culture, it's a shared common composite culture, there's the music, there's the language, there's the fact that it exists on the ground in Pakistan, but the global diasporas. Yeah. How do we now understand this silence? And so my question is, sorry, I had to add that in there in my own take, is how, do, how can we take the inspiration from Sindh, Sindhi identity, the, the kind of global diasporas, we're sitting here also, right, as a way of saying, actually, this isn't silence. Um, how can we respond to the hegemonic ownership of the narrative through this kind of idea of diversity? I mean, Sindh represents diversity and the pluralism that many people hang on to. And actually, we're not saying we, it's lost or vanished. Yeah. It's actually the pluralism which has been lost. And maybe that is the longing that many of us yeah, yeah, yeah. have. So Absolutely. I'm going to give it to you now to respond. Well, you know what? I, I agree with you completely. But there's no way that you can argue with something that is senseless, right? So you just have to keep doing what you're good at and putting it out. And I think that's what a lot of people here do. I have this thing where <coughs> sometimes on, on social media posts, I have young people saying, oh, um, I didn't know my grandparents suffered so much. And um, my thing is, look, it's not about suffering. I mean, suffering, that's silly. Suffering is commonplace. Suffering is banal. Everybody has some issue that they're dealing with, right? Let's not talk about suffering. Let's look at what they did. You know, how did they face their misfortunes? What did they do? Let's just focus on the good things. That's what I feel we need to do. You know, focus on the good things. Thank you. Let me, I'd like, I'm going to now stop my questions because we could okay. probably carry on all night. I'll, we'll take a few and I think we have a roving mic that will come around. So we've got one here. Just wait for the mic to come. I think the sound doesn't travel so well in this room, and we've got the recording going on too. So we've got one. I'm gonna. I've seen one back there. Two, three, and then I'll take the. <laughs> well, <clears throat> since uh, uh, this, I mean, book uh, has the background, the Sindhi background. I mean, uh, related with the sufferings and whatever. Uh, the, of this, uh, those who migrated, but to me it's a uh, uh, very, I mean, uh, thoughtful thing that you chose losing home. Losing home is understandable, but finding home, w what you want to, you see, it, uh, ask and suggest. You've asked me a really difficult question because uh, I, I mean, we spent a lot of time uh, struggling with that, uh, as you know, Sachin. <laughs> so I had, um, I didn't want it, you know, because when you say finding, it's like you're just walking along and you found something. It shouldn't be like that. But I think that for the, uh, you know, 
we tried to explain it and then we just left it as it is, assuming that, because you, you know, when you look at Sindhis around the world and especially in India, you never think of them as having come from somewhere else. You never think of them as having come from somewhere else because wherever they are, they found home. It's not a question. It's just a description. And that's what the book is about. Thank you for your question. So we've got another question from in the front here. Yes, you have it. Oh, thank you so much for bringing our um, history to us. Because uh, I'm a father of two young daughters, and they often ask about uh, what's our history, what do we believe in, and so on. And I try to fill in as much as possible. Uh, but the diversity and the pluralism that we, I think, have also sometimes uh, works to our disadvantage because our girls always say, you know, look at our, our Gujarati friends and look at the Punjabi friends. They've got such a strong community and they've, you know, they've got some something that they uh, are, are actually going to, like the Gudwara or the Mandir, whereas we are sort of believing in both and um, that itself I think sometimes loosens the ties and the communities don't have that sort of hold and bind. I'm not I'm not propagating that, but I'm just saying that it, it is a product of, of that diversity that maybe we lost the language or are losing the language. And to try to bring it back together again, I think it's just quite quite an uphill task. Uh, yeah, but I think it's not the plurality that's a problem. I think it's having been scattered so widely, not having uh, home ground. You know, that's actually where this uh, feeling of being lost and the lack of uh, secure identity comes from. Yeah. It's not really the plurality. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's also numbers, isn't it? It's uh, numbers. There are yeah. very few. And I think in what's really important, why... The, there's no voice in India because it is not enough to be a vote bank. So, absolutely. But I, I must also say that I, you know, I started off. I, I talked about how the language is lost, and partly it was the government that did it. Today, the Indian government supports the Sindhi language tremendously. There's this uh, body called the National Council for the Preservation of Sindhi Language, which is part of the um, HRD ministry. And they're well funded, they, yeah. But you know, it's a little bit artificial because you don't really have a space where the language is spoken on the streets. And you know, again, I told you about the conflict between the scripts and so, but still it's happening. And the fact is language is well al and alive in Sindh. So there's no reason why there won't be a resurgence. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're trying here as well in the Sindhi Mandir and so on. Yeah, but it's yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I tried it myself, but it, 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 as you said, the language is not spoken, is not used, so yeah. it's, it's difficult to, to yeah. keep it it's alive. It's like this artificial thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there's one question all the way in the back, and then I'm going to take the next three in a minute. And also just to say that we have got questions online yeah. okay. that we'd like to address as well. Hello. Uh, Anki, I would like to ask a question, but it might seem a little bit controversial, but it is just out of my curiosity. And ki okay, if it's controversial, then I'm going to ask someone else to answer. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> and ki our grandfathers and grandfathers left all their property in Sindh and migrated to the rest of the world. So what happened to that property in Sindh? Very, very long answer. There's something called the uh, what's it called? Uh, there, there is a huge, there's a body in Pakistan yes. which deals with the claims. I forget what it's called, but it's still very much alive. And uh, evacuate the evacuate. Evacuate board. property board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a board of evacuate property, and there are still properties which are have not been claimed. Okay. And of course, a lot of the the properties were claimed by. Uh, you know, people who had the power, even though they weren't, they didn't really have the 
uh, uh, entitlement. And they've been knocked down. New things have been built. There's a long, long, long story. Guru Mandir disappeared. There's a place called Guru Mandir, which is uh, Hindi Mandir. slash Urdu. Uh, but Guru Mandir, which is a Sindhi word, nobody knows where it is. Lots of stories. Yeah, the house is under the authority of the Sindh government nowadays. So it's a museum now. It's a museum. So that's an, a very good example because the Mukhi house, which was owned by the Mukhi family, the Mukhi family, they made this arrangement with the government that we will not claim it and you can have it, but you have to make it a museum. So they did that. And there's a very good, uh, a solid body called the, uh, uh, some endowment trust. Endowment trust. Uh, for the preservation of heritage. Yeah, and they do a lot of amazing work. So they have excellent, they, um, you know, they've uh, developed some of the properties. Okay, we have a few more questions coming from online also. Can Did, I have one question? Okay, brief, please. Yes, sir, you talked about this uh, change of script of Hindi. From the, uh, to Devanagari script. What was the reason for that? Is it that ki the Devanagari script is easy and the earlier 52 alphabets Hindi is very difficult to comprehend and to read and write? Because so I am a Sindhi and I have started to learn, read and write Sindhi from an app which is developed by Dada uh, Vaswani. Okay. But at this age, it's very difficult for me to go through all the 52 alphabets. So well, is just that the keep reason? trying. Congratulations for doing that, and no. just keep going. And I don't think it's that hard. I think you could try learning Russian, which has fewer alphabets, and see whether you find it easier. I don't think so. So it's okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. There's this. Can we just take his question? Yes, he's uh, this young man on the. Okay, sure. We'll take one here, and then we're yeah, going to go we'll online for a few more. And then a few online. Yeah. Then we'll come back and take another round. Just here, right? Hi, I just had a quick question about the um, religious iconography in the ho like the houses of Sindhi Hindus. So in a lot of the photos that I saw in the presentation, there was a picture of Nanakji in the houses. And my grandfather in his house in Sindhi also had a photo of Nanakji. And being someone who's grown up and been brought up here, I've always associated Nanakji with the Sikhism. So what is the connection that Sindhi Hindus have specifically with Nanakji? I think a lot of Sindhi Hindus were Nanak Panthis, and that uh, uh, the uh, Nanak, the teachings may have been brought by those Hindus who migrated to Sindh from Punjab. I, I think that's what happened. And uh, why, you know, today, like, uh, many families still have Guru Granth Sahib in their homes, and many still go to the Gurdwara for their worship and uh, that's that's all I mean that's what it is that a lot of it has changed because um, politically uh, Sikhism belongs to the Punjabis okay thank you very much yeah, thanks. okay so there is a question um, there's two questions by the same actual person so this is uh, I'll try this one uh, Vikas Wadwani so it has said so heartbroken to not be able to be hit there today your work and that of Nandita Bhavnani is so commendable. She was also at SOAS a few years ago, launching her book, The Making of Exile, which I was lucky to attend. She's based in Mumbai and you in Pune. Have you met her? And is there any collaboration we Sindhis can expect? Have you read her book? What do you think of her work? <laughs> and how, just a few questions, and how different or similar your book is to hers. And thank you for what you are doing. Yeah, hi Vikas, thank you for asking me that. I love talking about Nandita because she's like my guru. <laughs> and I couldn't have written my first book without her. Uh, I mentioned to you that I got, I read a lot of books when I was doing that first book when I knew nothing. I just talked to my mom, then I interviewed a few other people and all the books I read were from Nandita. She just opened her library. She told me, read this, read this, read this. I staggered home. Uh, with the load of the books she gave me. She came to Pune with another load of books for me, and uh, that's how it was. So I could not have written my first book without Nandita. 
And even today, I, don't, I check with Nandita, did I get this right before I put it out? Uh, I've read her book, I'm a great fan of her work. And uh, in my podcast, uh, when, uh, you know, I, my first season has eight episodes in it, which I've tried to cover, you know, uh, kind of outline of history of just before partition, during partition, and after partition. So the episode on partition, Nandita's a guest because she's an expert in that subject. Her book, Making of Exile, is it looks at every angle of the Sindhi experience of partition, and I would totally recommend that book as well. Okay. And uh, the other question is, um, there are a lot of painful stories due to partition that us Sindhis went through. I know in my own family itself, both my set of grandparents lost everything and overnight had to leave their havelis, savings, etc., and move to India. My mum's side built up their lives from scratch in Ahmedabad and dad's side in Ajmer. Have you touched on such difficult, upsetting stories in your book? Yeah, I have. And I, um, most of the stories are stories of loss. Most of the stories are stories of um, devastated, dev feelings of devastation, feelings of betrayal, uh, and um, uh, I also feel that those are things that happen to many people in life in different situations. People die, young people die, people fall ill, uh, you know, people suffer from, you know, or, you know, all kinds of terrible things happen. And I like to look at what happened after that, especially for the Sindhis, you know. Uh, they, I think that what happened after that is the real story. And just to say, Kamal has asked if you could share a link to your podcast. Uh, so the podcast is called Cindy Tapestry, and you'll find it on any, on on every podcast platform. Just Google. Uh, you, it's on YouTube. The YouTube channel is called Cindy Dot Tapestry. I hope you'll enjoy it. I've really enjoyed putting that together, and I really hope you'll enjoy it too. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to take a, just a few more questions, yeah. and our time is coming close. Okay, we have yes. one here. Okay. Uh, can um, we just can we could you use the mic because it's being we've got people who aren't in the room. Sure. Just, can, just wait one second. <laughs> Thank you. She's preparing. Yeah. Sorry, uh, a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, regarding the Sindhi script being used, my father used to teach Sindhi many years ago here in the UK, and it was not popular. He's fought very hard, but he was fought back when he was trying to say, use the Sindhi script. It, he was told at that time, if you're teaching the young children, use the Devanagari script because it's easier for them to do Hindi afterwards as well. And that was, a, that was a whole thing that was happening 30 years ago here in the UK when they were being taught. So we need to go back to, you know, he was very into doing that. And I'm just saying it's something that we've got to promote from, the, from here down so that it goes forward. It's okay. very nice to hear somebody who calls himself elderly, who might not be as old as, uh, you know, he's saying he is. But who is trying to learn the language? I think that's amazing. Yeah. And there is there are apps. Asha Chand is a campaigner for the Devanagari script, and she's done amazing work. So you can look her up. She has an app through which you can learn uh, the script and then the language after that. Okay. I have another point. The tapestry that you were trying to locate where it came from. Um, does the tapestry come from Manjand? I've been asked because I know somebody with a very similar surname, and I messaged them, and they said their family came from Manjand. If that tapestry is from there, it belongs to their forefathers. Wow. The name of the village is Malkani. I'll ask her. Lovely. And I will get, and, uh, I'll get your details. Uh, that's very exciting. Yeah. 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 Really so I've been asked to send a picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I will I'll write this down because I have to send it to the person right. who doesn't live in this country. Right. I'm trying to sort of say, because they call their company Kodanmal, okay. not Kodumal. Okay. So I'm trying to see if it's the same thing. Oh, wow, that would be great. So Thank you so much. Okay. One more question behind the One more, and then and that'll be our last two. Uh, well, uh, I have a little uh, request to Vivek Ranjan, 
جی ہی میڈ کشمیر فائلس اینڈ ناؤ دا بک از دیئر وچ یو روٹ سو دیٹ ول ہیلپ ہیم سو آئی ریکویسٹ فرام دس پلیٹ فارم ٹو مسٹر ویویک رنجن دیٹ میک سندھی فائلس سندھ فائلس تھینک یو تھینکس Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I am very much demanding from you. Last time we met uh, 10 years ago on the launching of your <coughs> first book. At Cricklewood, at the Sindhi Mandar. Yeah. yeah. No, no, not before that. In the East London. Okay. Uh, in, in a restaurant we arranged right. to get together. Right. So, so you were saying that uh, the stories from the Vanish homeland so i say what about the stories behind you left now who's going to collect those <laughs> yeah the tapestry uh, you have collected yeah. some of them and uh, that is uh, partially done but as my friend said finding home so why you need to find a home you are already in That's home all. Kaches, Sindh. That's true. Jaisalmer are some of the Sindhis, they say Sindhi linguist, linguistic territory. So how about the indigenous people who did not migrate, they were living since ever. So would you focus on them in your well, next... So I think I'm kind of done, you know. This is my work. There are lots of young people who are doing that mm-hmm. and they will continue to do it, you know. Yeah. So there will there is a lot of work happening. So mm, uh, I mean this is uh, something an area uh, where we can focus. Yeah. I well, mean there are people gen- doing general that, so general perception is that the Sindh is just the province of Pakistan. Sindh is much more than that. So all the adjoining areas whether it is on the other side of the border or in other provinces of Pakistan, it's uh, again a Sindh. So Sindh is not confined to that, it's true, just the province. You're right. I mean, there's a lot uh, in the partition story that has just not been done. Yeah. And, you know, right. People are doing it. Thank you. Right. One more here. We've, we've kind of run out of time. We'll, this t- we're going to Yeah, just to say that uh, after this, please, you're more than welcome to carry on the conversation outside in the foyer. We're just putting out some drinks and nibbles, so give us about five minutes here afterwards. But please do do carry on the conversation now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amma, and I'm part of the team that organises the Hidden History series here. Um, and my question is, because this is a hidden history, how do you or we, the wider we, get this history to a wider audience? beyond those who have a direct connection with this community? Well, actually, that's my question to you. <laughs> you know, because we do want the, uh, the story to spread and to be, to be known everywhere. And partly it's through the work that you're doing through your library. And uh, I think for us, you know, we use media, we use social media, but I think um, uh, the the, global network of the libraries is one of the most important ways uh, that so thank you very much thank you for uh, for hosting this well great on that note i would like to thank you sans for sharing your work with us here today at soas and then also to the soas library decolonization team who've been organizing this series which is just really you can see from people coming here that this these are the places where these conversations are really needed but also places where we can take conversations into new places and and kind of developing the ideas um one thing i wanted to ask you Saz, is to share with us wh- where people can get a hold of the book um right, thank online. you thanks yeah. for asking sure. so we have a paperback uh, uh, available on amazon but the um, you know the hardcover, the really fancy one that we've made was only available in India. Uh, so if you want it, then I'll have to send it to you from there. We have, I think, two or three copies. Three copies. Yeah. Sars has bought three copies only. Unfortunately. Okay, that's great. Which? Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there are people holding their hands up already no. wanting to have the first so, ones. So just to say that SARS will be releasing those three copies at the price of £15. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, there may be other ways, but looking online. children's stories and I'd be very interested to know if there's a whole um yeah there are a lot of Sindhi folk tales and the one collection will, that you will find very easily because it's on archive.org is by uh, gosh I forget there was this uh, Kinkade uh, uh, English writer K-I-N-C-A-I-D uh, Kincaid, actually he and his, uh, there were two of them, father and son, who collected a lot of Indian folk tales. And uh, they've got two sets. One is uh, Gujarati and Sindhi, and one is the Sindhi folk tales. Uh, there are these seven heroines of Shah Abdul Latif. Mm -hmm. So he documented those. Yeah, that's, uh, so that's a start. And I'm sure if you keep looking, you will find more. Yeah. Great. Uh, right. uh, that's brilliant, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming in person and online. And we look forward to seeing you all in the future at our future events here at SOAS. But thank you all. And there are some refreshments outside. <laughs>